So th there is a, a phrase that kind of entered into our vernacular. Um, it was actually coined in 2004. It became official in 2011 uh, whenever it was added to the Oxford Dictionary. And it is this little phrase that you already know. It's this, it is life hack. How, how many of y'all know the phrase life hack? Okay, it, it's a great little phrase. It is whenever you have a, a common problem and you come up with a creative solution. And so if it's one of those things that you're like looking around for, you can Google it and I promise you, you will find thousands and thousands of life hacks, little creative solutions to life's common problems. And so um, it, it's things like, you know, if you ever have gone to Kroger and you bought a Coca-Cola or like a 12 pack of Coca-Cola and you want one whenever you get home, but it's, it's warm and nobody wants to drink hot Coca-Cola. You like want an ice cold Coke. Right, but you don't want to pour it over ice because that waters it down, and you're like, Oh no, what do I do? Good news, life hack is out there and available for you, so you can have an ice cold Coke in 15 minutes. And this is what it is you take a wet paper towel and you wrap it around your bottle of Coca Cola, and then you stick it into your freezer for count it 15 minutes, okay? 15 minutes, and then 15 minutes later, you go and you have a ice cold Coca-Cola. Now the key is 15 minutes. Do not leave that into your freezer very lo much longer than that because then you will end up with a freezer to clean. But that is a life hack. Everybody say life hack. Life hack. That's a life hack right there. How about this? How many of y'all have ever worn flip-flops? You know, flip-flops and you had a blowout. Maybe you stepped on a pop top. I don't know what it was, but, but you had a blowout in your flip top, flip-flop. And, and so you're like, what do I do? Because I need to keep walking around. Well, here it is. Life hack is right, ready to help you. All right. You know, those little bread clips that you lose every time you open up your bread, you know, the little bread clips there, you just need to go to your pantry and find the 33 that are in there. And let's show them the picture up here. And you just take that little bad boy and you stick that on the bottom of your flip-flop and you have a life hack right there. Everybody say life hack. Life hack your flip-flop. You can go flopping around now. All right. All right. So everything's good. You know, how, how about this? Um, how, how many of y'all like eating Oreos? Like eating Oreos? Oreos are great, but you, you like dipping them in, in the milk. Anybody milk dippers? And maybe you don't, maybe you're kind of a little bit of a, a clean freak. And so you don't want to get your fingers dirty in the milk. It makes them sticky. And you're like, but I love my Oreos in milk. What do I do? There is a life hack for that. You just need a fork. Let's go ahead and show them. You just take a fork and you take a fork in your and you dip it in there. Life hack. Everybody say it. Life hack. Now, here is probably my favorite one. This one will change your life, all right? So this just change your life. So just be, be prepared. How many of you love eating cupcakes, okay? Cupcakes are great. The only problem with a cupcake is people put too much icing on the top because I don't want the icing. I want a cupcake, Okay, that, that's why I'm not an icing guy, all right? I, I don't like icing. I want the cupcake. And so it's like, well, how do you get around this? Because like you go to take a bite and it's just like all icing and then you're just left with like naked cupcake, you know, and you're just like, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Here you go. Life hack. You take the bottom of the cupcake, you twist, and then you put the top on the bottom and now you have a cupcake sandwich. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's genius. That's genius right there. Change your life. Everybody ready on the count of three? It's a life hack. Ready? Life hack. That's what we're talking about. These creative little solutions to common problems that we have because we were all faced with issues. We all face problems. We all have things that we're up against. And it's like, man, it's great to know that there are some shortcuts or ways around things to help us be able to like solve the problem that we are solving. But, but here's the thing that I know about life is that so often in our lives, it's not cupcakes and Oreos and Coca-Cola and flip-flops that are the problem. It's like, oh, I got a bigger problem than that. It's like, I got kids. How do I raise my kids, right? I, how do I do this? It's like, I, I've got a job offer over here. It might be more money, but I've got to think about this and about this. You know, you, I, it's like, I, I need to know, should I date her? Should I date her? Where should I go to school? Moms and dads, you remember a few months ago, it's like, should I send my kids to in person or should they do online? And so there are all kinds of things in life that we are always wrestling with. And it's like, it would be great if somebody just had a life hack for that. Just a creative solution to this, that little problem that we all have. Just like, how can we go about this? How can we fix this? How can we attack this? Well, the good news is there is a life hack for all of this. That God has given us an amazing life hack for all of the problems and all the decisions that we 
are facing. And that life hack is very simply put, it's just this, it is wisdom. It is His wisdom, God's wisdom. And so today we're starting a brand new series that's called Life Hacks, God's wisdom for our lives. And how can we use His wisdom and how can we you know, gain His wisdom so that we will know what to do when we are faced with our problems? Because that's really all wisdom is, is knowing what to do, knowing the right thing to do, and then catch it doing it. That is wisdom. That is God's wisdom. And so we're going to spend four weeks in the book of Proverbs, one of my favorite books of the Bible, to where we're going to be looking at this and saying, okay, here's some life facts. Here are some things that God has laid out for us in his wisdom to help us be better at life. Life hacks God's wisdom for your life. So if you got a Bible, I'd invite you to find uh, the book of Proverbs. It's there in about the, the middle there or so. And over the next few weeks, we're just going to be hopping around uh, that book. Now, here here you go. Ready for a life hack? Here's a life hack. There are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Every month has roughly 30 days or 31 days, except for that weird month of February that has 28 and then 29 every four years, okay? But so just stick with me. One chapter a day means that you will read through the book of Proverbs once a month. You read through the book of Proverbs once a month. That is 12 times in a year. That is gobs of godly wisdom for your life. Good news is next Sunday is November the 1st. So that is a great day to start with chapter 1 of Proverbs. God's wisdom. Now, the the book of Proverbs is written mostly by a guy by the name of Solomon. King Solomon. uh, You may know him as uh, David's son. And Solomon was known to be very, very wise. And and it all begins whenever Solomon has been anointed to become the next king of Israel. And what what the kings did, they had this little tradition, is that whenever they were about to become king, is that they would present an offering to God. And most kings would present like one bull. That was their offering. One bull offering. They would sacrifice it. It would be pleasing to God. And Solomon is like, okay, so... I'm going to do this, but I am not a one bull kind of guy. I I like to go extravagant. And so Solomon's offering is not one bull. It's not even 10 bulls. It's not even 100. He does 1,000. 1,000 bulls. He he goes 1,000 times past anybody else has done. And he's like, "Ah, this is me. And he just goes extravagant. And and. I don't necessarily think it was because of the extravagance, but I think it might have been because of the trust. But God goes to Solomon and he said, dude, this was amazing. He's like, because that you have done this, here's the deal. I am going to let you ask for anything. You ask me for one thing, anything, and it will be yours. He's like, I'm going to give you one wish. What is your wish, Solomon? And I wonder if God were to come to you And say, I'm going to give you one wish. You can ask me for anything. I wonder what that would be. I mean, some of us might try to like outsmart the system and go, I want more wishes. Okay, that that is my one wish is for for more wishes. But maybe others of us would be like, I want money. I want to feel financially free. You know, I I want to set up my family and the, the generations after that. Want money. Some of us maybe like, I want power, you know, I I want influence. I, I want to be able to help, you know, other people. Maybe some of you be like, you know, maybe it's like, I just, I'd like a boyfriend, you know, or I'd like a girlfriend or a godly spouse. You know, that's why like. maybe some would be like, we, we want kids. We've never been able to have kids. We, we want children of our own. Maybe, maybe you're watching online and maybe, maybe your one wish would be this. Uh, maybe you just had, you know, somebody really close to you uh, diagnosed with cancer. And so your, your thing would be, God, I got one wish. And my, my wish would be, I want them to be healed. God comes to you. One wish. I wonder what you would ask for. One one wish. Well, Solomon, he gets that opportunity. God's like, one thing, you name it, you can claim it. Okay? And this is what he says, 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 10. He says, give me wisdom. God, would you please give me wisdom and knowledge that I may be able to lead this people. Because who is able to govern this great people of yours? He's like, God, you told me anything I can ask for. I'm asking for one thing. I want to be wise. I want knowledge. Because you've tasked me with this incredible task to lead your people, and I want to do it in a way that honors to you. And so God hears this, and God's like, that is a request. 
And he says, Solomon, you could have asked me for anything. You could have asked for money. You could have asked for power. You could have asked for me to kill all your enemies. I mean, you could have asked for, for anything, but you chose to ask me for, for wisdom. And because you asked me for wisdom, I'm going to give you wisdom. And I'm not just going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you everything else to go along with it. And so Solomon ends up with wisdom, with money, with power, with all the things. He ends up with it all. But whenever presented with the choice, he says, what, can, what should I ask for? He's like, well, the one thing I want is wisdom. It makes sense because this is the same guy that would later, he would end up writing in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 16, he would say this, how much better it is to get wisdom than gold and good judgment than silver. He's like, how much better it is? He's like, you know, gold's great, silver's great, but the thing that's, that's most important is that we would get wisdom. He's like, that's the thing that we should truly want, that we should truly desire. We should truly want to know what God wants us to do, when to do it, how to do it. We should want that. Like, that's what's great. And I love what he says in, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. He says, the beginning of wisdom is this. Ready? Get wisdom. Isn't that great? It's like, wow, he is wise, isn't he? It's like, what's the beginning of wisdom? Well, just get it. Get, get, get wisdom. Because though it costs all you have... Get understanding, cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. But the beginning of wisdom is this. Get it. Go get wisdom. And so Solomon, this is just what he does throughout the entire book of Proverbs. He's just laying things out, just saying, this is what wisdom looks like. This is how you get wisdom. But, but one of the things that he does, and one of the ways that he helps us out is sometimes knowing what, what something is, the best way to know what something is is to know what it's not. And so what he does is he, throughout the book of Proverbs, he's like paints these portraits of not wise people. We call them fools. And, and there's actually three different fools in the book of Proverbs that Solomon lays out there to help us understand this is not what we want to be. Here's what we'll call them. The first one we'll call them the halfwit. All right? The, the halfwit. And, and so Proverbs 14, 15 says this, The simple believe anything, but the prudent Give thought to their steps. It's a half wit, okay? I, I'm not going to ask you if you know any half wits or any of these kind of there because I, I don't want you guys to get in fights later on because um, you're like, I'm married too. Uh, but anyway, um, so we, we've got the half wit, but this is just a person who's super gullible, all right? They believe anything. They're easily influenced, easily led. They don't think things through. They're, they're, they're half-witted. They're, they're very a simpleton is another way to put it. Second fool is they're the hard-headed, Okay. The hard-headed, now are we going from preaching to meddling, all right? It's like, oh, no, half-wit, but okay. But all right, so the, the hard-headed, uh, Proverbs 20, uh, uh, chapter 12 says this, uh, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. So the hard-headed is somebody who is just like, I'm not going to listen to anybody because I already, I already know. I already know what's right. And so I'm just going to go with my own way. That's the hard head. Then you've got the hard-hearted. So the half-wit, the hard-head, and the hard-hearted, the hard-hearted is arrogant, okay? Uh, Proverbs 21, mockers are proud and haughty. They uh, act with boundless arrogance. So the hard-hearted, the best way I could probably explain this is this. So if, if you're in a relationship with an arrogant, hard-hearted mocker, what they tend to do is they seem very savvy on the surface, they seem very smart, good with money, maybe good with relationships. But what they're doing is they use relationships for their own good and for their own benefit. And so if you're in a relationship with a hard-hearted, arrogant kind of person, then probably what's going to happen is the moment that you are no longer of any use to them, they will ghost you because they've used you and now they're done. And Solomon says... That's what we don't want to be. That's not wisdom, right? That's foolishness. And that's the way of the fool. It's to be a half-wit. It's to be hard-headed. It's to be hard-hearted. He's like, but that's, that's not what we want to do. We want to be wise. But the problem is very simple. It's this. Fools don't know when they're foolish. Right? I mean, how many times have you been in the middle of doing something you know, or, you know, or later and you're like, that gum, that was foolish. That was just kind of stupid that I did that, you know? But in the middle of it, you're like, well, this sounds pretty great. Right? Because fools don't know when they're being fools. And so the solution is, is we have to get wisdom. What does Proverbs 4, 7 say? It says, the beginning of wisdom is get wisdom. It's like, go get it. So that's what I'm going to spend the rest of our time talking about. How do we actually get wisdom? If this is what we need, if this is the ultimate life hack, how do we get wisdom? Three thoughts for you real quick. Number one is we fear God. We learn to fear God. God. Proverbs chapter 
1, verse 7, says this, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Proverbs chapter 9, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. We fear the Lord. Now, I feel like anytime I I use this little phrase, we need to fear God, that one of the things that we kind of think about, and maybe um, this is where you think, is like, I think sometimes we hear that phrase, fear God, and that means that we should walk around scared of him. You know, that he's going to smite me. He's going to strike me. He's just out there just looking to get me. It's like he's like this grumpy God, you know. He's like a grumpy bear. It's like don't disturb him. You know, don't get on his wrong side because he's got a bad knee and that bad knee makes him cranky, right? It's like, oh, that's what it means. We need to be afraid of him. But that's not what fear of God is in the Bible. Fear of God is very simple. It means to, to, to be in awe of God. It is a holy and reverential attitude, a holy and reverential fear of him where we recognize who he is and what all he, what all he has done. And in that, we're like, okay, this is the God of the universe. See, a big problem that has happened over the years is that we have become too comfortable with God. And so it's like, well, the big guy and I, the big guy upstairs and I, we're good. Good big man upstairs. I think the man upstairs above, you know, and I, we're good. We're good. And we've lost this, like, just like this reverence of him. We've become so comfortable with him. It's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're good. Me and God, we're good. We're like that, man. We tight. I mean, yeah, I know we're not married and we're doing married people things, but, but God understands. God understands. He's good. We tight. Yeah, I know I get wasted every single weekend, but, but, I, 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 but we're tight, man. God, God understands I just need to blow some steam off. You know, I, I know that I'm cheating my company and cheating on my wife, but God's okay with it because he understands everything that I'm under. We're, we're good. I mean, and I was baptized when I was nine, so I know. It's like that. We've lost this reverence, this fear of God to where it's like, no, that's not good. That's not right. He's not just some buddy up in heaven, some senile grandpa in a rocking chair doling out Werther's originals, just patting you on the head. He is the high and holy God. The high and holy God. Just close your eyes for for just a second. I just want you to think about this because just, just think about this. If God's presence, his presence is here, okay? But if you could see his presence... And if his presence was to overwhelm this room, and if you were to just look around and you were able to see what Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6, when he said, I saw the Lord seated on the throne in heaven with these angels, seraphim around him, people screaming out, holy, holy, holy. He's like, I fell down. I fell down and I was in fear. And I was like, woe to me because I'm a man of unclean lips. And if God's presence was visible to you right now, you want to know what you wouldn't be doing? It's going, buddy, God and I are okay. You would fall on your face. And you'd say, oh my goodness, who is this? Whose presence am I in? This guy is so holy. He's so powerful. He's so strong. He's mighty. He's big. He's got all these kind of things. You'd be going, "How how can I serve him? How can I be about his will? How can my life be about what he wants? How can I honor him? How can I share him? How can I serve him? It would all be about him. And whenever Solomon says the fear of the Lord is the beginning, it is the foundation of wisdom, it all begins with understanding who he is and who you are. It begins with understanding who God is and who I am. He's the God of the universe. He's worthy of our fear and our awe. And that's the beginning of wisdom. We fear him. We ask him. For wisdom. So that's the second thing. We don't just fear God. We ask God. We ask God. Proverbs chapter 2. This is what Solomon says. He says, cry out for insight. Ask for understanding. 
Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then listen, then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord. Then you'll know. You'll gain knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Jesus' brother James, he put it like this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. It's kind of, kind of the way this, this works for me. Is um, I, I call them little dart prayers, arrow prayers, wh- whatever you want to call them, okay? Basically what I'm talking about is that there are, there are times in my life whenever I find myself in a situation to where it's like I don't know what to do. And so I just, I throw up prayers. It's like, God, God you got to help me here. I don't know what to do. Like somebody will come into my office and, and they'll start to share their story and what's going on. And I can tell that it's like coming to a point to where they're like going to say, and what do you think I should do? And I'm sitting there on the other side of the desk just going, I don't know what they should do, you know. And so my, my prayer is always, God, you got to give me wisdom. God, command me what to say, how to say it, when to say it. You know, give me the right words to say. Use my voice box to speak a word to this person that's going to help them out. And so those are all just going on internally, just the entire time. God, you got to help. You got to help. You got to help. Sometimes it's, you know, like, um, God, why did you put that person on my mind? Do I need to reach out to them? Do I need to send them a note? Do I need to call them? Do I need to write a letter? Do, you know, what, what do I need to do? You know, God, you got to help me. God, I've been thinking about this verse for four days. I don't know why this verse is in, in a little hamster wheel of my brain, but it's just going on and on and on and on. I, I need you to help me understand it. What's going on here? What's going on? And so it's just asking God for wisdom continually. God, would you give me wisdom? God, would you give me wisdom? God, would you give me wisdom? We, we ask for it. Because God said, hey, if you don't know it, ask. I mean, that's like one of the things he's told you to ask for. It's like, you don't know what to do in this situation? Ask God. See, here's the problem. Here's what I do. Maybe you do this as well. So often I go to incomplete um, sources of information to ask questions. It's like I go to Google before I go to God. You know, it's like, oh, and it's like, how about this? Ask God, not Google, right? I mean, it's just like maybe that's a way to just kind of live my life. It's like maybe I should go to the one who created all things and holds it all together in his, in his hand. And maybe I should ask him and not some stupid algorithm out in California, right? And maybe that's where I should go. But we, got, we go to God for wisdom. We ask him. We fear God. We ask God. And the last thing is we trust God. We, we trust him. You know, if you ever grew up in church, you know, maybe you went to a VBS or your grandmama took you to a Sunday school at some point. Um, There's a verse that you may have memorized at one point. It's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Isn't that a great verse? It's a great verse. Trust in the Lord. All your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust him. Trust him. And so it's trust him unconditionally. It's not, I'm going to trust you, God, as long as things are going the way that I think that they should go. It's, God, I'm going to trust you even whenever I don't understand why things are happening the way that they are are going. And we trust him because we know that he is trustworthy. We know that we can trust him because he is the one who is all-powerful. I came across a, maybe a, a helpful just kind of object lesson here that might, might help you and help me just to think about it. And so just, just stick with me for just a second, just thinking about why we, we should trust God. So look at this little, little piece of paper here, right here, okay? So, so here, here's what you need to know. The, the distance from the earth to the sun is 93 million miles, okay? That's a lot of miles, okay? Um, that's a couple oil changes worth of miles. So 93 million miles. And so if that 93 million miles is represented by the thickness of this one little sheet of paper, okay? This is now representing 93 million miles. Everybody with me? Nod your head up and down if you're with me. All right. So 93 million miles. So the distance from the earth to the next closest star, which is Proxima Centauri, okay, would be, ready, 70 feet of pieces of paper stacked up each representing 93 million miles, all right? So just to help you out, um, if, if my math is correct, I believe that the actual peak of this ceiling in this room, it, don't look up, the, the lights will blind you like they're doing me right now, but it's like 30 feet, okay? And so you take two of these buildings on top of each other and add a third, and then you get to 70 feet worth of paper. And that's the difference distance between this earth Our earth that we live on, that we play football on, okay? Our earth and the next closest star, Proxima Centauri. Now, you take the width of the Milky Way galaxy, which is our galaxy and a delicious candy bar. But the Milky Way, 
the, the width of the Milky Way using our same 93 million mile measuring stick, it would be 310 miles of paper to get just the width of the Milky Way galaxy for a reference point from here to Panama City Beach is 310-ish miles. Paper, just sheets of paper just stacked all the way up there. Now, our Milky Way galaxy in the known universe of what we can actually see is a speck of dust in the known universe. And the Bible tells us this. That our God spoke it all into existence. He just said a word and it happened. Paul tells us in Colossians that Jesus, that our Lord, holds all of that together with just his word. Now let me ask you a question. So to the one who spoke all of that into existence, who holds it all together with his powerful word. Should you treat him as Lord and Savior or as a consultant, as an assistant? Because you all know the difference between a consultant, right? I mean, a consultant is you pay them money and they come in and they tell you what they think you should do and um, if you don't like it, then you're just like, nope, sorry, there's your money, just go, go, go along. An assistant is you just tell them, here's what I want you to do. And so often, we, we're, we're treating the one who spoke all that into existence, who holds all that together with his powerful word, and we're treating him like a consultant. And we're like, well, I like this part of what you told me to do, so I'm going to do that. But this part over here, I'm just going to push that off to the side. Or we treat him like an assistant and say, God, you're the one that's going to do this, and you're going to take care of this. But it's like, no, 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 no. He's the one that, that holds all that together in his powerful word. He's the one that spoke it all into existence. He's not your consultant. He's not your assistant. He is your holy God. And what does he say? He says, trust me. You got to trust me. You got to know that I know whenever a bird falls from the sky and hits the ground. You got to know that I know the number of hairs on your head. I know whenever one of those falls out or turns gray. I know all things. And so you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to trust me. And whether or not it makes sense to you or or not, trust me. If you want to know wisdom, if you want to truly, if you truly want to to grow in wisdom, you're going to have to trust me. So let me give you just two quick questions to think about. All right, I call these the trust questions. Question number one, am I willing to do whatever God says in Scripture, whether I agree with it or not? Because can we just agree on something? If God is who he says he is, if he is the high, holy one, knows all things, set all things in place, spoke it all into existence, all those kind of things, can we just agree that whenever I come across something in Scripture that I don't agree with, that I'm the problem, not him? You guys with me on that? Whenever I read the Bible and it's like, well, I don't like that. Guess who's wrong? Me. Not him. It's not like God's going out there, oh, my bad. That was supposed to get caught in editing, but it just didn't, you know? No, whether I agree with it or not, it's like I'm the one that has to change. He he doesn't change. I change. And the second question, am I willing to accept anything God sends, whether I understand it or not? Because here's the deal. If his thoughts are higher than my thoughts, his ways are higher than my ways, then there are probably going to be things that I don't understand and I just don't get. But I'm going to trust him and trust that he's going to work all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I'm going to trust him. That's wisdom. It's trusting God. So if you want wisdom, you fear the Lord, you ask God for it, and you trust him. And here's the thing, never give up on your pursuit of wisdom. Never give up. It is, it is worth the pursuit. It's worth the effort. It is worth going after. Because the, the beginning of wisdom is this, get it. Go get wisdom. Search for it. It's worth more than gold. It's worth more than silver. Go get wisdom. Go get it. Bottom line is this, wisdom is found by those most determined to find it. If you want it, I promise you, you can find it. You can find the wisdom that God has for you, for your life. You can know the right thing to do, when to do it, and how to do it. But you're going to have to fear him. You're going to ask him for it. And you're going to have to trust the one who holds all things together. 
And you know what the best decision, the wisest thing that you can ever decide to do? Would be to follow Jesus. To submit to him and to say, Jesus, I want you to rule my life. I want you to run my life. I don't want you to just be my savior. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my king. I don't want you as a consultant. I don't want you as an assistant. I want you as Lord and savior. And you know what? Maybe you're watching online and you're ready to make that decision. Well, I want to invite you to this website here that's on the screen. And I want you to go over there and fill out that quick form. And we'll be in touch with you real soon about what next steps you can take. But maybe you're here in the room. And it's like, I want to decide to follow Jesus because here's what Paul tells us is that Jesus is the wisdom of God personified and the wisdom of God personified. Jesus himself was willing to die for you to go to a cross so that you could be saved. And so if you've never made that decision and maybe you feel the Lord calling you in that direction right now, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pray for you and uh, then the service is going to be over and I will be right here in front of the stage. And I'd love nothing more than to be able to pray with you today. Father, we thank you that you do love us, that you have called us your own, that you have moved us from sons and daughters to slaves through the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray today, God, that your wisdom would infiltrate us, overwhelm us. God, there's some of us that uh, we're living as fools, and maybe we don't even realize that we're living as fools, but maybe now today a light bulb's starting to come on. And so I pray, God, that you would, through your spirit, begin to lead us and draw us to yourself. Um, God, maybe there's some of us that are in the room today or maybe even watching online and um, who are today for the very first time just recognizing their desperate need for Jesus. They're aware of their sins, aware of the damage that it has done to their relationship with you and with others. And God, would you help them to see the cross of Jesus, your, your own son, freely given up for us because you love us that much. And God, would you lead them to call unto you, to cry out to you today? So God, we we love you. And uh, we pray that we would be people who are pursuing wisdom, searching for it, because we know it's the most valuable thing that we can find, because it will help us. It'll help us to follow you as you want us to. And we pray this in your name. Amen.